What a song. What a version. Feeling good on your favourite local radio station. It's Alex Belfield here today talking to a man who everybody seems to love. It must be great to be you, John Barrowman. How are you? <laughs> I don't know if it's great. Um, but yeah, but it's nice to be liked. Um, yeah, and if you love me, bring it on. Bring it on. I'm, I, I don't know what to say to that, really. If that's what the, the, the feeling is, then I'm totally chuffed by it, really. I'll tell you what it is about you. I've spent years going to New York recording Broadway shows, and I've been in the West End for years in interviewing different people and there aren't many people who have a personality that's why people like you and Michael Ball are so massive because it's almost homogenized isn't it you have to look the right way you have to be a certain height you have to have blonde hair and you have to dance in a certain way and sing in a certain way which I have none of <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on being you anyway that's what Th- I'm saying thank you very much I, I think what it is is that people nowadays particularly people in the business really need to understand that they are people you know, we're like everybody else out there. Those of you who are sit, sitting at home right now, either, you know, having a cup of tea, cup of coffee, maybe having some toast or whatever, we do the same thing. You know, as I can't say it on air, but my mother used to say, everybody, at the end of the day, we all wipe our bottoms the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for cleaning that one up in more ways than one. How do you become unique and get the lead roles? Is it your appearance, your voice, your dancing, or is it all three together? I think it's a combination of everything, and you have to... <sighs> A combination of all of that and hard work. I mean, you know, I'm I'm not going to lie and say that I know that I'm I don't have a look that is appealing to people on stage or on camera. Okay, you know, I'm a realist. Um, I I know that you have to be able to sing in the West End. I know that you have to be able to dance. The weakest of the three things for me are my move is is my movement, and I um I really work hard to make that look better than what I can really do, and and uh, you know kind of pull the wool over everybody's eyes. In rehearsals, you should see me. It's funny because when I do rehearse the dance stuff, I have to spend a lot of time, more time than anybody else, one on one with the choreographer to get it right. So it's a combination of everything coming together. And it's also, you have to network. What people forget, and particularly people who are in the industry with me and are complaining that they don't get lead roles and they don't get this and they don't get that. Well, you know what? Get up off your butt and work because you have to network. You have to meet people. This is the business. No one's going to bring anything to you and go, oh, we want to make you a big, huge West End musical star. That ain't going to happen. You have to work at it. You got to you know, work through the ladder. I was lucky that I came in as a leading man and uh, a lot of my mates who are now leading men and leading ladies uh, had to work up through the ensemble and there's nothing wrong with that. I was just very lucky and I grabbed that opportunity. Was there ever a chance that you might have been a builder or a plasterer or something? I would love to, uh, you know, fulfill the fantasies of some of the the men and women out there who might be listening. Um, but uh, I do look all right in a builder's hat and a belt <laughs> with a hammer on it. But no, I never wanted to be a builder or anything like that. The one thing that I did want to be as a kid was a pilot. But then when I was about nine. 10 years old when I realized that that was just the gay thing because I really liked the uniform. I wanted to be a pilot as well, but then I realized I wasn't smart enough, so I thought, well, I'll just talk. Uh, Well, I realized that I didn't like flying. (laughs) (laughs) And and that was a a big part of it. Uh, I I, I don't know. I, I can truly and honestly say, although the childhood fantasies of wanting to be the pilot and maybe, you know, at some point, I, I never wanted to be a policeman or fireman or anything like that, but I... I can firmly say that from the moment I can remember, I've always wanted to be in front of an audience to entertain people. I've, I fell in love with the theater when I saw, uh, it was either one of two shows, because I remember my mother used to always take me to uh, every, every one of the Disney movies that came out, Jungle Book, um, Mary Poppins that had music in it. And when I was watching, uh, I think it was Babes in, in, Babes in Toyland, a pantomime or something over Christmas when I was in Glasgow at Kelvin Hall, and uh, then seeing Peter Pan, and when I saw Peter Pan fly out into the audience, I was hooked. I mean, I've never wanted to do anything else. So I'm, I'm, I was born, put on this planet, made the way I am, and I'm doing what I was here to do. All right, we're going to take some music from the brand new album, which is called Another Side. It's great driving music. They're all big numbers, though. They're songs like All By Myself, Feeling Good, that we started with. These are songs that you can't really tamper with if you're not going to do them well. Were you nervous when you take on these type of songs? I wasn't, actually. I'm going to be totally honest with you. I, I came in because I and to do that, and I, I chose those songs because I love them, and all of them mean something to me. They all have... I'm really chuffed that you said it's a driving album because that's the way... That's how I listen to my music, in the car, 
commuting back and forth from London to Cardiff. And uh, uh, I, I really am. It's important to me that the songs meant something to me because I know the listener then can can take it on board and feel that I'm actually saying something. I'm not just singing a song. And uh, if you check out my website, all of the stories behind all of the songs are on the website johnbarrowman.com, and it explains more as to why I chose the the, the music. So, which is the best song on the album? Then I, you, I knew you were going to ask that, and that is the most <laughs> that is the most rubbish question you could ask someone because every one of them is a favorite of mine. I know which one my least favorite is, but I'm not going to tell you that either. Well, let's start with that one. Go no, on. No, 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 no. I can't do that. No, no, no. There must be one song though. It, like, like in every musical, there's that eleven o'clock number where you look forward to it coming, you look forward to performing it, and when it's gone, you're kind of miserable. Uh, well, it's probably the least well-known one then, and it's called uh, "Please Remember Me." It's not an 11 o'clock number, but it has a really, it's a, it, it means a lot to me because my uh, partner, Scott, his sister, uh, Sandy uh, Gill, died uh, three years ago of brain cancer. And uh, the irony of the story is Scott's brother is one of the best brain surgeons in the UK and couldn't save her. And she called us all the night before she died. And we didn't know this, that she was going to die the next day, obviously. And she said to me on the telephone, please, please remember to look after my brother. So I, you know, I'm saying, Sandy, don't be silly. The next day she was gone. So when I heard this song in America, it's a country and Western song that we've kind of readapted. And it's called Please Remember Me. It's originally written about a, a love breakup. But if you listen to the words, you can really relate it to the loss of somebody. We're back on your favorite local radio station. It's called Please Remember Me. It's Alex Belfield talking to one of my favorite people, John Barrowman, because he seems to light up the screen. One thing I find curious about performers and stars generally, I'm very lucky I get to interview a lot of the top people. I, I don't believe you can be trained it. I don't believe you can go to university and be taught it. You've either got it or you haven't. I agree with you. Um, I think you can, if somebody has the knack there, you can develop it. But it's like, for instance, when we're doing the, the shows, uh, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria or Any Dream Will Do to Find a Joseph, uh, I can spot it immediately. I can spot it in the, when we narrow it down to the, the, you know, the 250 that we have to choose from, I can choose the ones that I think have that knack. Now, it's whether they are willing to work hard enough to develop it and to make it work for them. But you're right. You've either got it or you don't. It also, I think, matters that if you're... you're uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, if you are like everybody else, you're a human being, you like to talk, you can communicate with people. And I think that's important for people to relate to you if you're honest. Honesty is the biggest thing. And that can that makes people want to know more about you if you're honest. You know, I, I don't understand people who come into this business and this industry and, you know, they know, we all know when we start in this business that there's the possibility you could become famous. We don't, we know that. We want to be working actors. Now, if that fame comes, why do you not want it? Why do you go, oh, I don't want to sign autographs. I don't I want to lock myself away. I don't want to be near people. You know what? Get out. I do not get people like that. If someone asks me for an autograph, unless I'm sitting and having an intimate dinner, I will sign it. And surely it's the ultimate compliment that you've dreamed of, isn't it? If somebody actually wants to meet you, then you've achieved your goal. Dude, this is what we work for. This is what you all hope. Everybody in the world hopes that you will if all of a sudden land on your feet doing something that will get you, you know, what you want. A nice house, nice clothes, a nice car, whatever might be your big thing. And, you know, when it happens to people, you want to celebrate it. And I'm that's what I'm trying to do is celebrate my success and thank everybody for helping me and getting me where I am. Um, but I don't understand those people who don't. The whole uh, drugs and alcohol issue, that's, that, that's people who are, th I think, thrust into success very quickly and can't uh, and don't know how to deal with it. And that's their escape. So that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's when we're on the uh, Jeremy Kyle. We'll talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Robbie Williams performing in front of those 150,000 people a couple of years ago. And I saw a man who was just crying on the inside. And I thought, how can you be that successful, that big? and hate it so much. They loved him. They were warm to him. They didn't boo him. They weren't throwing cabbages at him. He'd got the dream. I don't, I, you know, it, I love Robbie. I love his music. I love him as a performer. I've, I've seen him live in New York and I think he's spectacular. If, he, if he's unhappy, you know, I, I'd say, give, give me a call and I'll, I'll have a chat with you and maybe I'll be able to help you out. You see, this could be your new thing. We could have counseling no. the musical. No, you know, <laughs> count it. Now, eight shows a week where you get a different celebrity <laughs> on stage and you just sing to them about how to help them. <laughs> <laughs> just help yourself to my love. <laughs> <da, da, da. laughs> we're here today with John Barrowman. We're going to take another piece of music. Then we're going to come back and talk about your life and your career, your childhood. Um, 
one thing you mentioned earlier, how do you solve a problem like Maria? Connie sat in the chair uh, only a couple of days ago talking to me about The Sound of Music. Mm. Um, she said she's leaving the show in February. I was surprised when she said that because it always worries me when somebody's so brilliant at one role and did it perfectly and then decide to leave to go on to better things, which is what she believes she's going to do. How do you feel about her going? Is that a good move or a bad move? I think it's a good move. I think she it might have been a better move for her to go a little sooner. Uh, I always believe that you should stay in the show, uh, you know, a year is a long time. And if you stay in the show for a year, that's fine. Uh, you might, a year and three months, okay, you can do it, because I've done that myself. But I think uh, Connie can do other roles, and no doubt about that, because she's, uh, but as I've always said, with her, with Connie and with Lee Mead, their next big challenge is the role after Joseph after The Sound of Music because that will prove their diversity and how good they really are. Um, and I know they're good because we put them in the, those positions. We, I, 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 you know, my, my reputation is on that also. But, um, you know, you have to, she's making a big, a bold move and she has to because she has to let go of her security blanket. And uh, whatever role she does, she has to find it a different way of doing it. She has to, to dig deep down to bring out that new uh, well, that new character, that new role, because she's not Connie playing Connie, she's Connie playing the role. But the thing that she, the thing I think she should really do is go do something completely opposite. She should play a hooker. I, I mean, I'm not <laughs> I'll become kidding. Become a hooker. No, I mean, just, <laughs> well, some people might like that. I don't think I don't think Connie's boyfriend would like that very much. But yeah, no, she needs to do something I think completely different. Because if she plays something too close to mm. the Maria figure, people will say she's always the goody two shoes. And that's something I had to kind of break in the early. Uh, years of my career also so I think you'll probably agree with me though it's unlikely she's going to find something as high profile as Maria in the sound of music at the Palladium at the moment because I mean those roles are so rare aren't no, they no 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 of course that well of course you're right and and sh I, I'm, I, sh I assume she knows that as I know that as everybody else does because there's very few times in your career do you have those big moments and you know I'm 40 years old and I've been doing this now <laughs> so I got I never thought I said 20 years in the business dear uh, no it's not not 20 years yet um this will be a big party when it is uh i have uh the years i've been in the business i've probably had those kind of defining moments i've probably had about maybe i'm guessing off the top of my head five or six you know that are that huge so you know you you, you they come few and far between but she'll still sell sell tickets in the next show she'll still hopefully put bums on seats um and she'll still do a good job she will always be no matter what you go to see connie or lee mead in they will always be reliable uh performers and nobody can possibly doubt her ability and her talent because she did just literally light up the stage well yeah, i saw her in the first night and i thought she did a tremendous job i was i felt good that i help to choose her I tell you what, let's give you all the credit no, never mind her talent no let's, don't give me the credit at all please don't because <laughs> someone will write some article in some newspaper saying I, John Barrowman thinks he's responsible for the success of Connie no this new album's tremendous it's in your stores now it's called Another Side this is my favourite song off the album Heaven why did you put this one in I chose it because Heaven uh, it, it describes um, you know my relationship with my partner and I'm, I hope it describes the relationship with a lot of people out there with their partners or husbands and wives and whoever you may may uh, spend your you know intimate moments with and it's a it's just such a great song and it and, and it is it, it's it's heartfelt we're back on your favorite local radio station talking to john barrowman today that's heaven really nice song off the new album which is called another side what were you like as a child terrible my father said that if i was the first we, they wouldn't have had any more and I kid you not, <laughs> that was that that was the my you know. What I, were you precocious or outrageous? What were you? I was well, pretty much the same as what I am now. Outrageous. <laughs> uh, I didn't sleep. My mother, my, the doctor told my mom and dad they had to put me in a cot, just just leave me in a, a playpen cot overnight, and I would eventually fall asleep. And they'd put me in there, you know, when they'd go to bed, and when they got up in the morning, I was still up playing. So, and I'm pretty much the same way i'm a night person as opposed to a day person uh you know and but i've had to change all that because of the you know what i'm doing with all the filming and things but um i was pretty much a handful in the sense that i 
Oh yeah, I guess I was a little precocious. I I knew what I wanted and I didn't want to back down. I, I remember there was one instance my father, you know, it was very typical of me. Um, I, I wanted to do everything that everybody else was doing, and my brother was a very is, is a very was a very good football player, and he um, would go up to the park in Glasgow and play football, and he was going to be on Rangers junior team before we left the UK, you know the UK, and uh, I went to go play one day, and I came back and I had the, all the gear on, and my my dad, you know, had given me the pep talk on the way back, and I walked into the house, and my mom said, "So son, how'd you like it?" And I said, "Don't like it, mom. Get dirty. I don't I don't like it. I get dirty." <laughs> So I think there was a defining moment in my life. <laughs> I think the signs were there, weren't they? Oh, they were there from day one. Were you the kind of child where when your mother would come in the bedroom in the morning and open the curtains and the beam of sunlight would shine through, you'd suddenly stand up and sing a number? I mean, were you just waiting for the spotlight to hit? <laughs> People would like to think I was like that, but no. My mother would come in the morning and open the curtain and I'd be in bed and go, Shut the curtain, Mum! <laughs> yeah, I would do that more. But I did, uh, you know, I, I, I say this, I, I'm, I have to be very vague on some of these stories, and I apologize to you when I do this, but I, I have an, an autobiography coming out in February, and uh-huh. I'm, I'm under restrictions from the, uh, uh, the publishers about a lot of things. But there's a huge section about my childhood with when I would go to the record store my mother worked in, and I would be put on the counter to sing uh, all the top ten hits of the of the you know the week to the sta- the people who would come in and uh, I was like the, I was the living jukebox I won't tell you where they used to spend their penny but you know <laughs> it was uh, uh, that was a, that's a different phrase isn't it spending yeah. a penny means going to the bathroom um, I mean I won't tell you where they used to put their money. That was the joke. That was a really bad one. But um, uh, it was a double joke. It was a double entendre. Um, yeah. So I used to I used to do that. So it wasn't really the ray of sunshine, but it was in the record store because I knew I had an audience. What's depressing now is the fact that we're going to have to sit here for another hour in about three months and do this entire program again. About the, the book comes out. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> hey, you know. So that there's nothing bad about that because then I can tell you all the dish. Not that I'm saying talk to you is boring or anything. No, no. Um, we then moved abroad because this isn't a Glasgow accent, is it? The Scottish accent I only use. When I'm with my family, we moved to the United States uh, in 1976. To my father was uh, ended up being uh, an executive uh, quite high up in Caterpillar Tractor Company, which is the big earth moving uh, equipment, big yellow tractors. That's my dad. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he must so, have been very proud of you when he was walking around the factory. He was actually. You say that with a little bit of jest in your voice, but my dad, my dad is very proud. I mean, this this thing was uh, all of our, all of my my parents' kids are very. You know, all of us are very diverse. My sister is the, uh, you know, if, if anything, my sister is the brains, my brother's the bronze, and I was the beauty. Uh, <laughs> no, my my sister's the academic. She is a um, she's a, a professor of English literature and journalism in America and uh, at a university and she also has penned my autobiography uh, cuz I wanted to keep it all in the family cuz she knows me the best and she makes the joke now that she has a gay man living in her head <laughs> um, the uh, my brother like I said was is now an executive for the Northern Illinois Gas Company he was a sportsman and my brother was on the American Olympic uh, first non-American citizen to be asked to be on the American Olympic uh, soccer team the year they boycotted and um my uh i'm the entertainer so we're all very diverse so yes my father was proud of me and still is proud of me there's no doubting what you do on stage and what i love about your type of voice i'm a big supporter of people like michael ball because he makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up when you're in a theater and it's not easy to get your voice right to the back if you're in the crappy seats how did you know from a young age that you were good enough to succeed because we see it on x factor where guys come through and of course on your programs that you've done on the bbc where these kids have undoubting belief in their talents and they're useless you don't know you have no idea and the one thing you have to have an element of confidence in you, I think, and I think that's taught in schools nowadays. I mean, I was taught in America. It's that go-getting attitude, and I think they're doing it more over here, and I think it's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with having confidence. I, I, you don't know you're going to be a success. You don't know you're good enough. You're constantly trying to prove yourself. The thing that, like, for instance, Michael and myself and others who are in our position have that others don't have is the work ethic to push. And if something goes wrong, we have confidence in ourselves to I, either admit that it's gone wrong or we look someone straight in the eye and they're telling us to do something, we say, no, 
You know what I mean? That's the difference. And uh, I, I think Michael would agree with me. It's not about be just being able to hit the back of the, the, the stalls anymore because you have microphones that can assist you to do that. And what happens are the people then who rely on... It's it's difficult to describe because it's, it, it, I got to choose these words kind of correctly. Maybe those people who don't succeed are the ones who rely on all the little bits around them that assist them rather than concentrating on them, if that makes any sense. You, you, you are the instrument. You are the craft. So don't rely on all those other bits. that They're there to assist you. They're not there to make you, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. I think the misconception in today's society through X Factor and even programs like yours is that you can get it easily and it can come to you for free and you don't have to work hard at it. Just the other week, I interviewed Gordon Ramsay. People think he's a TV star. That man works 18 hours a day in a kitchen. Of course he does. But I don't expect people to know that and people to understand that because that's what the process that I go through to put that 90 minutes on television to entertain you, right? It's the, it, make a reference, it's like when you're building the, a car. What goes, the hundreds and thousands of hours that go into building the car, when you buy it, you don't really care about. You just want to know that the product you're buying drives, gets you where you're going safely. So when you sit and watch that TV program, you don't care about the amount of hours that have gone into it. You want to know that you're going to be entertained and you're going to get good quality and it's going to come have a result at the end, right? So for these people who think, that's what I mean when I say people are sitting around waiting. Elaine Page told me, in the very beginning bits of my career, she said, do things because do things that make you happy and do them because you want to do them and don't sit around and wait for people to bring those things to you because it will not happen. And there was a period in my career before uh, um, I, I really kind of kicked myself up the rear end uh, that I was sitting around waiting for. I thought, I'm good enough. Why aren't people bringing things to me? Well, you know what? They won't. And that's the, that's the logic that comes about. You got to get up off your butt and you got to work for it. You got to go out and get it because if you don't, you're going to, in years to come, you'll look back and you'll regret. And I never want to have a life when I'm sitting in a rocking chair, looking back and going, I wish I had. This is not a leading question, but if you'd have been in Glasgow, do you think you'd be here today? You say those, I get asked those questions a lot. And those are hypothetical questions that I can't really answer because I, I was still wanted to be an entertainer when I was in Glasgow. So I think probably I would have pushed myself to do that because I had parents who were behind me um, and they probably would have pushed me to do that because my, my, my dad is an, was an, you know, a, a, a businessman and pushed himself. Um, um, it's not to say that any culture, there are people who, you know, it, it may happen, it may not happen. That would not be a reflection on Scotland at all because Scotland is a very, you know, they, I, funny enough, I think the Scottish are probably some of the hardest workers that you can, you know, find. There, There's people who are going to complain about what they're doing. And my philosophy is if you don't like it, get out, you know, go find something else to do. But um, uh, because there's a lot of people who would love to have the job and like to, to be in that position much more than you then. Everything's different. They work. They work hard on Broadway. They work hard in the West End. I think, and in, in you know, it's a difficult thing to compare. And you know, would I be doing this uh, if 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 I'd grown up in in Scotland? I I don't know. I can't answer that. I really, you know, but I couldn't think of doing anything else. All right, we're going to come back next, and we'll talk in our remaining moments about how you became the man you are today and what a man you are. Uh, we're going to take another piece of music from the album, Another Side. I'll let you choose one this time. What are you enjoying listening to off your own album? Um, well, the lead track, which uh, has the video on my website, and also uh, you can watch um, the making of it and uh, if, if you choose to. It's uh, All Out of Love, and it's a song from my childhood in the 80s. Go on, give us the website. www.johnbarrowman.com we're back on your favorite local radio station talking to John Barrowman today, or should I say www.johnbarrowman.com. <laughs> it's really nice to talk to you, and I'll tell you why, because you seem to breathe a breath of fresh air into shows. I think that's why you're invited on so many of them. It seems like the old showbiz ethics of being entertaining and bigger than life seem to have gone with some of our newer, younger stars, maybe of the BB generation. They come to life when the microphone's turned on. I guess you make that your priority, that you're here to entertain when the microphone's on, whether that be on stage, TV, or on the radio. Absolutely. And you would also, if you were to come on the set of Torchwood or Doctor Who, you would know that I also entertain while I'm there because I think a happy workplace is a is a productive workplace. And um, I, I, it's just the philosophy I've got. You know what? I'm not an angsty, maudlin 
grumpy person. I, you know, I joke and say that I get up in the morning, I'm not a morning person, but I'll still get up and jump around. And, you know, as I say to Scott in the morning, when we wake up, do the dance, give me a dance. Let's dance. You know what I mean? So it's, it, but you have to, What you know, and I know everybody doesn't have, I'm, I'm fortunate. I, you know, I'm, I'm living my dream. I'm living the things that I always have dreamt about and I'm so appreciative of it. So why would I get up and be crabby? I do have crabby moments. Don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? I do have those moments. I chuck my toys out of the pram. Okay. <laughs> we all have them, but I take a moment after them and I, you know, reevaluate what's gone on and realize how lucky I am. But those moments are usually not because I'm upset about what I'm doing. It's about a situation that I'm in. You're in a lucky position now that through the TV shows, people have got to know you. You can now go on tour as you. That must be a great thrill that no longer are you in the show. You're in the John Barrowman show. Uh, <laughs> it's a long show, let me tell you. <laughs> um, I, I've never thought of it that way because I've always, on stage I am a character, on television I am a character except when I'm playing myself. And okay, you know, I'll, let me be totally blunt and honest. I am my product. I'm my business. So if it is the John Barrowman show, I'm going to promote myself. Absolutely. And uh, the only person who is going to promote me is myself, the people who have a vested interest in me, or my mother and father. You know, so that's it. And um, I don't apologize for that. I don't apologize for trying to make myself successful. Why? Why should I? Why should anybody? And what a thrill it is that you can put tickets on sale with your name and people will come opposed to a, a show name. Well, that, that is remarkable and that's amazing to me. I mean, the concert tour that, I am, that I'm doing, uh, when it went on sale prior to the release of the album, uh, you know, they, the day that it went on sale, which was amazing to me, they called, the promoters called and asked if I'd add dates because it's selling so well and that's not even that's even before the publicity has even started so yes i'm thrilled absolutely amazingly thrilled by that but i still will be part of a show that one day will have the show name on the ticket you know and uh my name will be underneath the title well maybe above it <laughs> <laughs> right we've got to go ever so quick now because we're running out of time we've got loads of music to fit in i've got a lot of questions to ask okay. you so we're now about six years old we're a bit annoying how do you then go from that to starring in some of the biggest musicals in the west end i it's it, there's no formula answer i can give you it just it you know i i knew i wanted to do it when i was in high school my mother sent me to uh, uh i went to a modeling agency i learned how to hold myself poised and blah 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 which was rubbish and then then I went to study, I decided to go off to a place uh, called Opryland USA and that's where I got my kind of formidable training in a sense. And I also did all my community theater stuff. Amateur dramatics I think are a big thing for people to learn. So I love that there are amateur dramatic companies out there doing shows and productions because you know what? You have stars in your productions that one day could be big. And I did that in my hometown. Any, you know, my my uh, uh, one of my very close friends, Beverly Holt, who was my, mus my musical director director for my cabaret stuff she said John you have to do the rubbish shows to know which are the good ones did you always stick out even in those days in the beginning that your work ethic your dedication did teachers say to you did you have stuff written about you that you you tried harder than the rest because I can't believe you could be here today if you didn't no I'll, I'll be honest with you that would be that would be a correct statement because my report cards always said something like that but I'll be honest with you I failed math I failed geometry I was not interested in those subjects and the one thing that I, you know, I I'm, love seeing at the moment, there's a lot of this uh, push again to get people into uh, programs where they're being trained for specific crafts. And I, I do believe in that because I don't think every child is, is a university student. I don't think that's for everybody. It wasn't, I went to university, but I didn't like it until I found that I wanted to be in music and, and I, I really committed to that in music and theater. Uh, then I was happier. But in high school, hated all my other subjects. I was an okay student, you know, then America, they do it A and B, C, D, and, and F, right? I was always in the B uh, category because I flunked maybe one or two subjects because I just hated them. What, what use was geometry going to be to me when I'm singing a fabulous 11 o'clock number? <laughs> You know? And that is the sad thing about America. My cousin was brilliant at sports, but if you don't achieve a certain academic level, they don't let you do sports. Well, a guy who's going to be brilliant at American football isn't necessarily going to be any good at maths. So Listen, exactly. But what I, I don't want teachers getting down on me because I, my 
my brother-in-law and my sister are obviously are professors and doctorates in universities. Education is important. But what I'll say is higher education is not always for everybody. So I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in having apprenticeships, having work programs for young people to go to. And if your child shows any inkling, whether it's carpentry, uh, plumbing, uh, you know, avionics uh, or, or musical theater at a certain age, push them in that direction. Academics is all right. You know, math is great. But being fabulous is more important. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know you want me to say yes to that. On. Let's I'm move, move on, on from that one. I just want to talk about some of the productions you've been in. Miss Saigon, for example, to me is one of the anthemic musicals of our generation. Yep. Les Mis is there as well. Yep. Was there a dream world that you always looked at getting? And have you already achieved it? Or is it still there to be got? I'm, I, there was never a dream role that I looked at getting. Well, I, I'll tell you a situation. This is a snippet from the book. I was in my, hi, in my, my bedroom with my high school mate, a girl named Laura Sales, and we were listening to the musical as it just been released, Phantom of the Opera. And she said to me, John, what do you want to do with it for the rest of your life? And I said, Laura, one of my big dreams would be to work for someone like Cameron McIntosh or Andrew Lloyd Webber in a show like that. And four years later, I was in Phantom of the Opera in the West End. So... Um, I have goals. I have dreams. I've, I've done Miss Saigon. I've done most of the big musicals. I've done them both here and on Broadway. Uh, you know, so I, I, I have goals and I have aspirations. I still do. I don't tell people what they are. But in my little book, I achieve, when I achieve them, it's such a thrill. It is such a thrill. I presume your biggest difficulty now is that you're in that wonderful position where you're able to say no. Yes. Which is completely unique in this business. Yeah, yeah. Um, there must be things on, on Broadway, even in Las Vegas now. There's some amazing shows that you could go in. Presumably you haven't got the time with the commitments with the TV I, stuff. I would love to do Vegas. I think Vegas would be great. Yeah, there's things that I say no to. There's things, there's, I've been, I was offered approximately seven West End shows last year. I was offered uh, four Broadway just in one week. Um, so, and I've had to turn them down, had to, because I have commitments with, uh, uh, Torchwood and with, uh, Dr. Who, which I have no qualms about, you know what I mean? But I will, I say this on the radio now, I will return to the West End or to musicals because it is my first love and I will do one. It, it might be a little while from now, but I will be back. I'll be back. I suppose that's a real difficulty of show business, isn't it? Where you're at the point now where you're too busy to turn down stuff that maybe three years ago, five years ago, or certainly 10 years ago, you would have only dreamed of doing. Exactly. But that's what life is all about. When you're wanting to get to your position of if it's success or prosperity or whatever, um, you know, to make your company work as the best you could, you do everything you possibly can to get there. And then when you get there, then you can sit back and relax a little more. We've had quite a lot of new musicals come in recently with uh, Wicked. We've got to spam a lot now and Hairspray just opened with Michael yes. Ball which are all brilliant actually Yes. do you have your eye on something that when you've got time you really want to do is there one of those roles Michael said that he really wanted to play a woman in a frock we all have dreams we all have aspirations and uh, as quirky as they may be I can kind of relate with Michael <laughs> <laughs> um, I you know they're already doing the show and Philip Quast is going to be in it but I would love to have done La Cage. Now, whichever role, you know, people, I would probably have ended up playing, I think it's Iber, the, the, the more masculine one of the, not, and I'm not making any judgment on myself because of that, <laughs> but the one I wanted to play would be the, the, the one who performs in the nightclub in the frock because uh, it's something different, something fun. There are other roles that I have my eye on, and um, I, I just can say to you right now, I have had a discussion with... Uh, two very big prominent West End musical theater producers, one of them who is a composer and the other one who is the same as, um, name same as a raincoat. <laughs> yeah, let me think, let me think, who could that be? I, I I'm, in fact, I'm going to have a meeting with Cameron uh, in the next couple of days to discuss something. So that's why I'm saying things are in the pipeline and I will be doing something. I don't know what it is. Well, I do, but I'm not going to say. You're in the movie of the producers, which I just thought was absolutely tremendous. It's always been my favorite musical just because of the comedy in it. Outrageous, but still funny. Yes. And there aren't many musicals that come around like that that have so much effort put into them and such dedication. No, the, in, and it's funny because there's very few musicals come around, but I, I like to, you know, I, I say thank you. There's two guys in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, uh, Neil Zayden, 
and uh, uh, um, Craig Zayden, sorry, and Neil Marin, who um, uh, do, they started by doing Sunday night, you know, with Disney and ABC in America. They started doing these uh, musicals. They did Gypsy. They did uh, Mrs. Santa Claus. They did loads of stuff uh, on television. Then they moved into the movie element of it, you know, and they did Hairspray, uh, the film. So they brought back kind of the resurgence of movie musicals in a sense that paved the way for movies like The Producers, like Chicago, uh, you know, um, uh, I think actually they were also involved with Chicago. So it, it's taking the right show and making it work because some would say The Producers was a, was a success in the element of its production, but not a box office success. Uh, so, but Chicago, on the other hand, was a huge box office success. Um, so you just, it, it, it's a give and take kind of thing. And, you know, the Cole Porter biopic that I did, I'm just happy to be involved with them. It, mm. That was a dream watching Fred and Ginger, you know, one day wanting to be part of movie musicals. Very finally, let's talk about Torchwood. It's just great, isn't it, to be part of the most successful franchise on TV at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I again, I can't... There's words that can't describe it. Every day, I you know, I wake up and I you know when I go to work, I'm I've, I've said before I get to you know travel in time or be in the TARDIS or uh, fight an alien or save the planet. You know who else gets to do that every day on their job except myself? You know Captain Jack and and do- the Doctor, and the fact that I'm the best one of the buddies of one of the most iconic uh, British. Uh, figures being the doctor and now Captain Jack himself has become iconic and the ironic thing is that um, you know uh, uh, Torchwood is one of is is the most successful and the highest rated show on BBC America in the US so it, worldwide it's becoming a huge success you know big success in its in its science fiction world um, I, I you know I can't complain it's it's an, it's amazing and it's to have children come up to me and I'll be driving my car and you know I can see the kids will recognize me and say it's Captain Jack <laughs> you know and I love that I think that's absolutely spectacular and you get a thrill when you see all the merchandising not just because you might get some money out of it but when you see yourself <laughs> in a little 8 inch form one of my one of my biggest thrills was to see my eight-inch form. Um, that was one of the, that was one of the biggest moments for me because as a kid, I played with action men, I played with GI Joe, I played with uh, uh, little you know figures and and dolls, you know, and stuff like that. I have no qualms in saying I did have a Barbie and a Cindy along with action man. Um, my mother was very diverse, so I um. It's all uh, her fault, isn't it? Really? No, I feel yeah. Some someone said actually we we did a we did a thing where we actually figured out it was my dad's fault (laughs) not for why you're thinking let's not go there um no i'm joking we uh uh when i saw the doll that and i had to approve all the the molds and things like that i just i couldn't i couldn't wipe the smile off my face (laughs) and to see myself in in books you know i go into i go into a bookstore and i open up a book and or there's a picture of captain jack on the front of a book i mean i used to get annuals as a kid you know christmas annuals the doctor who christmas annual i now get the doctor who christmas annuals for my niece and nephew and i'm in it yeah and that's just i can't i cannot describe to you the the feeling it gives me. There is a certain element of luck and serendipity with this business. You're only as good as the production you're in. You can be the best star in the world, but if you're in a flop, it's going to fail. I've been in quite a few flops, and uh, I don't dwell on them. I move on from it because, like I said earlier, like we're going back, there's five or six of those big defining moments in your career that will happen to you. And Doctor Who and Torchwood are, you know, two of those defining moments and uh, yeah you know you have to have a good team around you you have to in a sense spend to spend money to get the quality and get it back and if you don't it's going to show I don't know whether you've heard, I'm slightly psychic. I sense from the feeling I'm getting from you that you're feeling that this last hour has been a bit of a flop. This has been a major success. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, th- I think everybody listening will think it's been a success. All right, let's go shopping. OK, so here we go. We've got the CD we've got to promote. So another side, John Barrowman's new CD is in the stores now. OK, we've got the uh, John Barrowman Brussels Sprouts there in Sainsbury's. <laughs> we've got the John Barrowman <laughs> book, which is out in February. You're in Panto in Birmingham. Yes. I interviewed you in the summer in your outfit. Just tremendous. I would go out shopping in the ball ring like that. 
no, no. they'll love you. Just you wait. Just you wait till I'm in Birmingham. But all the people who are listening in Birmingham at the moment, I, I know you are because I know this is playing on one of your biggest uh, radio stations. Please, if you see me, come and say hello. I, I definitely am looking forward to my Christmas in Birmingham. I, I can't wait. Really it's a whopping theatre as well. I think it's regarded as the yeah. biggest panto in the country. It, it is the biggest pantomime in the country. Uh, we will have 3D imagery. We will have uh, a genie that will be 3D in front of you. You'll be able to interact, basically, like, you know, rub the 3D lamp. Uh, you'll be able to, you'll, you, you will see Daleks on stage. <laughs> we have everything. So we got the book, the CD, the pantomime. Yes. Anything else I need to plug for you? Oh, yeah. There's another show on BBC One primetime Saturday night coming out called The Kids Are All Right, which is a, a an ent- light entertainment show that will be on Saturday evenings to where the adults compete against children. And it should be quite a good laugh and fun. It's been really nice talking to you. www.johnbarrowman.com. Thank you very much for talking to <laughs> thank me. Thank you very much. And thanks for, thanks for listening, everybody.